Welcome to the second episode of DeMille Belgium Germany Recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Armstrong, and joining me as always is a Canadian who has an awful problem with confusing his suntan lotion and analgesics, Logan Saunders. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm pretty sure you won't have got that, that joke. You will do by the end of this episode, though, because there was something I spotted that was very interesting. <laughs> and I do have to say, before we get into the episode, God, we're awful at guessing. Uh, I believe my top two suspects from the end of week one were both executed this week. Granted, one of them fell way down my suspect rankings by the time for execution, but it still doesn't look good when we when I said who my suspects were at the end of last week. No, I actually have them written down in front of me, and I'm not gloating at all because you know as well as I do, I had Kevin as my number one in both the first suspicions and in our pool. But you actually had Dami, then Kevin, and then Samina last week. Yep. If anyone has any doubt that we are not experts on this show, just have a look at this week, because not only did of our six top three suspects last week, between the two of us, three of them go, but also my top suspect from last week went on the pool. One of Logan's number one suspects on his pool choices last week went as well. I mean, Papa Bear has bamboozled us. What can I say? Well, I mean, it was fun. At one episode, though. I know, but it's hilarious to me that, given that your first suspicion last year was the mole, your actual first suspicion on both the suspects and uh, and our pool, and now we've fallen to the point where two of your top three from last week both went out at the first opportunity, and my top one from last week went out at the first opportunity. It's just ever so slightly mortifying, but also hilarious for me. Yeah, both Vietnam and Greece I did really well with, and that right from, right from the get-go. And this season, it's a bit different. This season, not so much. I think at this point, two episodes into the season, you're no longer allowed to say that you, you are amazing at guessing Belgian balls. Well, I mean, there was one, based off of one episode. Yeah, you might redeem yourself by the end of the season, but at the moment, it's kind of a bit shaky ground for you, I think. I'm just relishing the, the the fact that, for once, we're both as shit as each other at this. It's usually me who's terrible at this. But what an episode to actually talk about, because this may be one of my favourite live episodes we've ever talked about on a podcast. It is absolutely brilliant from start to finish. I found myself laughing out loud, I think, four times while watching this episode. And Logan never finds anything funny. I mean, if you've heard any of the previous nearly 300 podcasts we've done together, Logan's laugh can never be heard in the background, ever, ever, ever. No, I'm just completely stone-faced and serious the whole time. Nothing tickles me. Nope. If we had a hypothetical soundboard, I think there would be about six or seven different laugh clips that I have for you. (laughs) Usually when it involves Willie Summers, let's be honest. Yeah, he's the one that gets a good chuckle. So previously, 10 new contestants were in for the shock of their lives as they had to defend their spots in the game against 10 mystery attackers. They failed, meaning that Noah joined the group and Jens was left behind without a mole book. Once they reached Germany, everyone began with a hug, much to Sven's disgust, whilst also learning about each other. They explored creepy castle rooms to save each other from elimination, and six of them were left vulnerable, leaving just Noah, Dami, Kevin or Lennart as the one who should have gone home, but nobody did. And they will go home. Yeah, isn't it convenient how by the end of this episode, three of those people are vulnerable and two of them do end up going? Who'd have thunk? So after the surprise of the ending of last episode being the Noah could be the mole video, everyone interrogates him, and he's drinking quickly like this is the first taste of alcohol he's ever had, and he's not telling his mother. He's very, he looked very, very nervous with everyone's eyes on him. They're like, oh, you could be the mole, eh? You could be the mole, are you the mole? Nope. Nope, nope, it's been yet the mole. <laughs> if you think from Noah's point of view, this is, what, day three. He's had two days so far where he's just kind of ingratiated himself with the group, he's not felt like another, and then they drop this bombshell video at the end of the execution, at the end of the last episode, going, oh yeah, you know that guy you're actually quite cool with now? Yeah, he still could be the mole. You can't feel safe around him. Like, that's just mean to him. That's just really, really mean. And have it where it's in front of everybody already tense in their chairs, and they see that video, and he has nowhere to go. He just has to sit there with all the eyes on him. It's like a celebrity around paparazzi. I feel really bad for Noah, because 
as we said last week, he looks very young, even for 18, and makes us feel very old whenever he's on the screen. But he just looks so deeply uncomfortable when he's being interrogated by everyone and essentially shutting himself up by using a beer bottle as a uh, pacifier. Yeah. <laughs> I think there'll be something more that Sven would do. So we have another opening quote in German again. It is a Johann Sebastian Bach quote this time, and it is the müssen nur die richtige Taste im richtigen Moment berühren, which means you just have to hit the right key at the right moment. And we begin on day four with them still in Bergaras. Sven drank a lot last night because it's his birthday. Not that it gets mentioned again. And Jill says that today is all about music, and they can choose between classical or classics. Four of them will be going to classical, and six for classics. And Katrine volunteers for classical quickly, as does Anna Lotta, and Philip and Kevin join them. They have to learn to play a piece on the piano, preferably without hitting any wrong notes. And they get to head back to St. Gore, and are trained by Falco, the mayor of St. Gore, who is also a singer and pianist. And they're going to be performing a piece by Bach that evening. Each of them will receive a small component of it to play, and be accompanied by Falco. Is it the guy from Star Fox? Yes, it is indeed the guy from Star Fox. I know we've mentioned this in our Historians podcast. We love the Show Shallows Challenge. We've made no secret of the fact we adore the Show Shallows Challenge. It's one of the most brilliantly tense, wonderfully executed challenges they've ever done. And last season, we kind of had one that was definitely inspired by it in the Greek Dancing Challenge. This is 100% inspired by it again, and I love this challenge. Not just because... It is an actual skill, and it's something they're really testing them on. And as it happens, two of them do technically have that talent, in the fact that uh, Katrina and Analos can both play the piano pretty damn well. However, it also has the unintentional consequences on the other group, which elevates this challenge even further for me. The fact that one wrong key forces a car to do an emergency break. I just love that there is a note diabolique and every time someone hits the one note that is not in that uh, in that piece, a light goes on on the dashboard of the other challenge, and the driver makes an emergency stop and essentially tries to kill the four people in the back of the truck. I just adore it. It's it's wonderful. And I've said this many, many times when it comes to Belgi. I have no frigging clue how they came up with this challenge, but I love that they came up with this challenge. And it's the sort of challenge that only Belgium can do. You would never see Vidum do two challenges like this where one really does have an impact on the other, but at the same time. The closest you get is something like the kayaking and abseiling challenge from Czechia. Yeah, I, I think that would be very interesting where they're all where production's trying to figure out, okay, so what's the penalty if if they hit the wrong key? Hmm. How about whatever other challenge is going on, like 30 miles away, the driver of that vehicle has to suddenly hit the brakes as hard as possible and nearly kill everyone that's riding in that car. Oh, by the way, those people in the car are going to be in their bathing suits in a pool of water trying to do karaoke as well as charades at the same time. Oh, I just, I love, I mean, I mainly love the other component of this challenge, which is the carpool karaoke bit. But I just love the fact that this wonderfully straight-laced, emotional, talent-based challenge has a direct impact on the fact that the other team are riding in the back of a moving van in paddling pools with emergency stops being pulled left and right on them. It's just delightful. It's a, a genuinely hilarious challenge to watch. And I'm so glad that I didn't have any prior knowledge of this challenge being a thing. As soon as I watched it and saw the van pull up and it said carpool karaoke on the side, I'm like, oh my god, this is going to be insane, and I already love it. So, Kevin says that he taught himself a bit of ukulele from uh, YouTube, or ukulele as normal people call it. Ukulele. Yeah, he, he pronounced it ukulele, which I think is actually the the correct way to say it, but no normal human being outside of Hawaii calls it ukulele. I think he was talking about the video game that the Banjo-Kazooie oh. makers made. Right, that makes more sense. He uh, he just trained himself on ukulele. Right. Yeah, yeah. he didn't mean any, any instrument. He was just spouting out random facts about himself, about what he likes to do. He's like, yeah, I taught myself how to play the ukulele video game. 
but which had a good soundtracks. But but uh, sure, I can tackle piano too. He's just a massive fan of Platonic games. What can we say? Yeah, he really likes those collectathons. And as I said, Anna Lotter and Katrine both do play the piano, which is a massive advantage in this challenge. Each of them is worth a thousand euros if they don't hit any bum notes at the performance that evening. And the piano seems to be hooked up to a buzzer, which we wonder what's going to happen to that. And Katrine teaches Philip as she's confident. Kevin is actually surprisingly talented and progresses quickly. And Katrine tells Philip that they can't practice for three hours in a row, as he won't last that long. And I think that's very presumptuous, especially from what we've seen of uh, of Katrine and Philip's friendship so far, that she's going around accusing him of not lasting that long. Especially given that she did say last week that her husband is also called Philip. <laughs> and Falco gives him a little bit of advice, which, inspired by Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, is just, don't panic. And thanks for all the fish. Thanks the audience for all the fish that you get. They're paying for your fish. And I would say this is the the first challenge of the season where we've really got an impression that Katrine is used to being the boss. I don't know how much of the um, the Facebook conversation between me and John Dolan you saw uh, today on the RTV Warriors page, but he agrees with me on this that Katrine was giving people some stink eye during this challenge. She goes into full-on piano teacher mode. Yeah, for want of a better term, she was definitely in her bossy mode. John's first message this morning was, all in capitals, I cannot tell you how much the wrath of judgmental Katrine silently suffering through routine human error pleases me. And I can't think of a better way to describe that, to be honest. Yeah, she was do- she was correcting their hand position, saying, no, don't hit that key, what are you doing, what the hell are you doing? I mean, she scared Philip into trying really, really hard to the point that Philip only made one mistake when he eventually performs. He was practicing on cement blocks outside while waiting. Yeah, I genuinely would be a little bit terrified of Katrine, I think, if she was in her kind of boss mode. Also, thank goodness that when Belgians and Germans get together, that they end up having to speak English to understand one another. That really made this an easy task to watch. (laughs) It made it an easy challenge to watch, but there is, at least from personal experience, a little bit of mutual intelligibility between Dutch and German. Because I can kind of understand a little bit of Dutch written down, purely because I understand a bit of French and German written down. So it's it's actually a little bit of a surprise that they didn't resort to Philip being the translator in German, for example, because we know he speaks very good German and actually sounds like a local. I guess just because everybody's second language is English rather than, rather than say for the Belgians, their second language isn't German and the German guy's second language isn't Dutch. So the fact that they all speak English as a second language means, hey, let's just all speak English together. So the other six return to St. Gore as well, and are driven around in their own version of carpool karaoke. Literally. They are in the back of a truck, in inflatable pools, and the better they sing, the more they win. There are four songs, and the best four will be in the pools. They choose Noah, Samina, Sven, and Lennart. They each get a song worth a thousand euros, and the worse they sing, the more the money drops. Dami and Yasmina are in the car behind them, watching on a screen, but without being able to hear them. Three words from the lyrics are highlighted, and they have to guess them to bank the karaoke money each round. Did you know any of these songs? Just the last one, Nine Nine Luftballons. Yeah, I was going to say, if you don't know uh, Nine Nine Luftballons, then you've never heard a German song before, because I would have been very surprised had they not used Nine Nine Luftballons. I had no idea of the other ones. Bindles said he recognised one of them. I think it was the third one, um, because apparently that's how in Australian schools they're... um, They're taught to count from 1 to 10 in German. Oh, okay. That's what you said, at least. So one of them is a more educational song? Yeah. So, the first one up is Sven, and his three words are sea, sand, and freedom. They get the first two quickly, but struggle with freedom. They earn nothing for that song, although they would have earned nothing regardless, as Sven can't sing. So much for being the Schlagel King. Yeah, it all basically just turns into... um, into the Netflix game show Sing On, which I think they did do a German version of, actually. So this is almost certainly what it was inspired by. And as we mentioned, there is one note on each piano which, when played, forces the driver of the van to make an emergency stop. That is the only note contained in the Boite Diabolique. 
I think the car behind must have had to have an emergency stoplight as well, because they were following reasonably closely. And if a driver slums on the brakes in front of them, it is an absolute miracle that they didn't then go into the back of them. It's a <laughs> pretty dangerous challenge in that respect. Yeah, even with it being a closed course, there had to be a lot of planning. Yeah, there must have had to be a safe distance for them, at least. So Lennart is the second person to sing. His three words are girl, world, and goal. And they get two correct, but again, struggle with the third. Yasmin finally gets goal, and they bank 346 euros, rounded up to 350. Noah's three words are police, hex, and night. And the van goes a little bit Berlin nightclub for this one. Philip keeps hitting the forbidden key, and they only get one of the three words, so lose Noah's 630 euros. And then, as we mentioned, Samina does get the iconic Neun und Neunges Luftballons, aka Germany's most famous song, outside of David Hasselhoff's discography. Her yeah. three words are Horizon, <laughs> Firework, and War. And I must admit, the entire Samina singing scene is just delightful. It's probably the best thing of the entire episode for me, is just how whimsical it is everything scored to Neun und Neunges Luftballons. It's really quite nice. I find it funny that my one German co-worker from my old job on my first day when she said that she grew up in Germany until she was 12, 13 years old, I asked her, oh, you know, are you a fan of David Hasselhoff? And she had no idea who David Hasselhoff was. I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe he's not in, as big in Germany as I think he is. That's a lie. <laughs> She's just lying. She, she has all the CDs. <laughs> Everyone knows who David Hasselhoff is in Germany. Did I ever tell you that David Hasselhoff used to follow me on Twitter? I'm not sure if he still does. No? Uh, did, does he just follow anybody on Twitter? No comment. But yes. I'm now actually going to check whether um, whether he still follows me on Twitter. He definitely used to. Yeah, he does. He, the Hoff still does follow me on Twitter. That's actually quite impressive. How many people does he follow? He follows 38,400 people and is followed by 472,800 people. Oh, okay, so you may end a pretty elite list. Yeah. He doesn't follow you, though. No, I'm, well, I never tweeted David Hasselhoff, so no. Neither have I, I don't think. He just followed me randomly, years ago. So yeah, Samina's three words are Horizon, Firework, and War. And as I said, the entire Nana scene is brilliant, and they get all three words and bank 825 euros, rounded to 850, for a total of 1,200 of 4,000 for the challenge. The piano players are allowed two mistakes. If they make a third one, they will lose their thousand euros. Philip passes with just one mistake. Kevin fails with all three. Anna Lotta plays flawlessly. And Katrine also plays flawlessly, earning them 3,000 and 4,000 for the challenge. Where would you have placed yourself in this split? If I was the mole? Yeah, say you were the mole. I don't know, you think you'd want to be in Kevin's position where you think, oh, I know how to play a different instrument, but I have no idea how to play a piano. That would be an easy sabotage. Or Demi actually had a good point in her confessional saying, hmm, maybe the mole was one of the people teaching how to play the piano and could have just essentially coached the other person to keep playing the wrong key for a while while the challenge was going on in the in the van. So that I thought, hmm, that would be a sneaky way to sabotage. Yeah, I think of the people in that challenge, Philip and Katrine were probably the most suspicious. I did obviously suspect Kevin, but I'm excluding him now because he goes. I think Philip and Katrine were probably the most suspicious people because Philip definitely kept playing that forbidden note. He was hammering the note diabolique to keep the, uh, the car stopping if he is the mole. And Katrine was definitely coaching people. And we don't really see much of Katrine playing at all. We don't really know whether she was responsible for too many notes, Diabolique. That's my suspicion. I'm sort of struggling with who my top three are going to be this week. Um, I've got two solid ones, and then the third one I'm kind of umming and ahhing about. And I've not decided who it's going to be yet. But Katrine was at least slightly suspicious in this challenge. She was more suspicious later on, but she's at least slightly suspicious. And if Dammy was on the right track there with that confessional, I suspect it was probably put in to be more about Katrine than Anna Lotta, put it that way. Yeah, with Philip, though, he still earns the, the full thousand euros at the, when it's his performance. He only makes one mistake. Yeah, I think 
on balance, just looking at this completely kind of independently, you want to be in the piano player side, purely because you have control over 1,000 euros of your own money, plus you can then mess around with 4,000 euros of the other team's money. If you're on the carpool karaoke side, you literally only have control over, officially over a thousand euros, but maybe if you're in the in the van, you can slide into people and try and make them sing worse or something, or do bad mimes. But I think you have more control over money on the piano side than you do on the van side. Yeah, some of the miming was pretty bad. Like when they were trying to mime the word freedom, I'm thinking there's got to be better miming for freedom or how... Uh, Demi and Yasmin were barely able to pull out the word war because I was thinking they weren't really miming the word war. I'd be thinking gun, machine gun, fight, but I wouldn't be, I don't think I'd be throwing out the word war into there. No, I mean, if if the van wasn't moving, you could just do a, a Josh style barrel roll occasionally with your gun and, and jobs are good. And you'd work out war from that. But also, I think Samina had the easiest song because, as I said, it is probably the most famous German song that isn't sung by David Hasselhoff. No, nine and nine's Luftballons isn't known all over the world. Not necessarily that version, but um, the English version is definitely known all over the world. And if you know anything about the lyrics, Krieg does come up, which is the German word for war, quite a lot in that song. And then Sven, even if they guessed Sven's words, they were only going to get thirty-seven euros. No, I don't think they would have got anything. I think um, Jill said in confessional they wouldn't have got anything, even if they'd guessed all three words for Sven. They wouldn't have rounded it up to 40 euros? No, they seem to be rounding it up to um, to the nearest 50. Well, that would throw from nearest 50 to 37 is, would be 50. Yeah, but they, he, he specifically said that Sven wouldn't have earned any money regardless. So Kevin says that he had a harder passage than some of the others who could play, but it was pointed out that he volunteered very quickly to play that passage. He's the mole. I know. I, st- I still think that Kevin's coming back as the mole. I'll be honest. He's still my number one suspect this week. I'll cut to the cornfield from the first day, and then and then Jill says, Hey, uh, welcome to the cornfield. You were just executed, but you could still be the mole. They just keep one person in every time. It's a double elimination <laughs> every single week. Of one person keeps coming back. I know we've joked about that before, but it would be brilliant if it happened with Kevin here. Yeah, it's just Jill has all these pre-recorded messages with the mysterious figure at the end of each episode. Yeah, although having said that, the German mole legacy of that is is a terrible idea, so no, we're not having a double execution and then one person coming back, because bad things happen if that happens. And Yasmin does reveal to the piano playing group the forbidden note aspect of their challenge, and everyone is, let's be honest, pretty amused and surprised by it. So, they wake up on day five in Sankor, Katrine and Philip act as the human alarm clocks, and Katrine joins Andalosa and Yasmin in bed. Philip gets to wake up Kevin and Noah, and we get a wonderfully non-erotic scene of Sven rubbing in suntan lotion to Leonard, which, if you look closely, is not suntan lotion. It is instead an analgesic called Volterol. Yeah, Volterin or A535. I'm assuming from your time in the uh, in the pharmacy, you are well aware of Volterol. Yeah, we well, we don't call it Volterol in Canada. It's Vol- Volterin, yeah. But yeah, I don't know why they called it suntan lotion. I don't know whether that was just a a subtitle translation or not, but it was an analgesic, definitely. Yeah, I recognised the ball right away. It's September in Germany. You're not going to need suntan lotion. No. So they are driving to Brem, a small village in the Mosul, famous for Riesling wine. Jill tells them there is a small monastery in the valley below, and they will be transporting the wine down the 68 degree hill to the monastery, where a party is going to be going on. Along the way, they will pick up two wine glasses, which are full of wine. But four of them, Katrine, Dami, Sven and Annalotta, will get their two glasses now. Each glass that survives the trip above the white line is worth 200 yards of the pot, and they've got two hours until the party begins. What would you do as a mole in this challenge? I was mole, I guess. I was thinking a good strategy would be to try and make it all the way to the end, but have your wine glasses just below the line. That'd be the most subtle way to sabotage it. Because it's like, you made it all the way to the end, but oh, you got screwed over because it was just below the line. Those should should have counted. Poor you. It's an interesting episode overall, this, because the first two challenges, each person each person doesn't really have that much control over the money, if you think about it. Yeah, it's much smaller, much smaller segments for 
being able to get money out of the pot. You have to get a bit more creative to wreak more havoc. Yeah, it's just really interesting because genuinely every person only has control over at most 1,400 euros in the first two challenges. You can't really impact each other unless you're on that piano team. Yeah, then maybe you don't put them on the piano challenge because you figure that's where everybody will be looking. Yeah, maybe. So, Sven sets the pace, and it's a bit too quick for everyone else. Analossa drops her two glasses almost immediately, and then has to basically sit on the hillside for the rest of the two hours. And their first stop along the way is tasting. Samina immediately volunteers, but it ends up being Philip, Kevin, and Yasmin doing it. Each of them gets three glasses of wine, one white, one red, and one rosé. They have to put the glasses in the right order in three minutes, white on the left, rosé in the middle, and red on the right. If they succeed, each of them will get a 200 euro glass to carry. They get the red one easily, but struggle between white and rosé. But they are correct in the end, and get their first glasses. Samina, Noah, and Lennart reach the second stop, which is stomping grapes. They have to stomp enough grapes to make 2 litres of wine per glass that they want to carry, meaning 12 litres of juice, need stomping for all 6 glasses. Samina and Noah get the lucky job of stomping the grapes, while Lennart gets to run all the way through the vineyard and grab them some grapes. And they only have until the original wine carriers reach them, to stomp the grapes. So there were two scenes in this episode that made me laugh out loud really hard. One was Philip opening up the blinds to wake everybody up and shouting, Good morning, Vietnam! And the other one that made me laugh really hard whenever they cut to it was Samina and Noah stomping the grapes. Because <laughs> those poses of them trying to help each other stomp the grapes was one of the funniest visuals I've ever seen on a reality show. You'll remember, if you cast your mind back to the back in the last year, when we did Amazing Race 32, YouTube did not like one of my banner choices for the uh, Manila leg, because they said that it looked like um, like Hung was giving someone a blowy. I thought about making a screen cut from this bit of the challenge, Albano, this week, and I thought there is not a chance in hell that YouTube will allow me to put that on YouTube, because it looks vaguely sexual, regardless of my opinions and regardless of the context of it. It looked like a screen grab from one of your films, let's be honest. <laughs> but it was just, oh, that was so funny. It looked like the sort of thing that was in your mucky video collection. There's no better way to put it. <laughs> but you're like, great, but just, yeah, just this, it's like, man, Samina goes from being a flamenco instructor to being one of Noah's instructors by the way of the between the age gap and the and the stomping poses there because they've had a few stomp the grape challenges on Amazing Race and on the American version of the mole over the years we've seen people stomp grapes a bunch of times but I've never seen a grape stomped using that type of teamwork technique where people are physically supporting each other's bodies as they stomp on the grapes. I was never prepared for that visual each time they cut to it, and I just couldn't help but laugh out loud and probably wake wake people up. Day five was the day when Noah went from a boy to a man. As if the beer drinking wasn't enough of an initiation process. Exactly. This is basically the puberty episode for him, because he... He started off drinking beer, then he got into some weird positions with Samina. Yeah, he's me like, oh, is this what it's like? It's really going to confuse him once he gets into a real relationship. I just love the idea that Noah's going to be secretly listening to our episodes and just going, why do these guys think that I'm that young? I'm not that young, guys. Come on. You know, the next time he goes on the day, he's like, oh, want to come over to my place and stomp some grapes? It'd be one of those situations where if we were going to the finale, he'd come over to us at the uh, the after party and just go, guys, I've been listening all season. I'm not a fucking child. Yeah, like there's candles, there's candles lit around the, the bucket of grape sets that are, that are about to be stomped. This is a great first date idea. Why didn't I think of this years ago? So Dami moves a bit too fast and drops one of her glasses when she moves. The tasters can earn their second glass by tasting three more glasses, all of which are white this time. One with a hint of lemon, one with a hint of peach, and one with a hint of lychee. If they put those in the correct places in three minutes, they will get a second glass each. And Kevin tells Philip off for constantly influencing them on the wine choices, and they get it wrong because Yasmin casts the wrong tiebreaker, so they don't get a second glass. They are, however, especially in Yasmin's case, a little bit merry by this point. Yasmin cannot hold her wine. <laughs> Because it's six glasses that they just drank in a really short amount of time. 
Well, they're only tasting glasses, aren't they? But they were taking multiple tastes of each glass, though. So I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure I saw a couple of those glasses get empty. If you ever drink, say, because they only had three minutes for each round, right? So, and it was probably only like a five minute reset between the two rounds. So, just think they had to drink. I'm gonna guess they consumed well two or three glasses of wine in the span of ten minutes. That's gonna hit you once you start having to pick up a tray and start to move. Because that's a lot of wine to drink. Because that's, that's a very, very short amount of time. It was quite notable that Yasmin was not driving that evening. I was about to say, yeah. But Philip was. How was Philip able to drive? But not... Philip is a much larger man anyway. And your alcohol tolerance is generally your, your size more than anything. So I suspect that Philip's body probably processes uh, alcohol a little bit faster than Yasmin still. Well, I think his exact words when he wanted to volunteer for the tasting part was, I could drink enough for an army. I believe that was his exact quote. And then somebody else said, Philip is the type of person to go to a wedding on the weekend. I'm trying to figure out what the meaning behind that quote is. Maybe he just wasn't invited to said wedding. Oh, just go, just go crash his weddings on the weekend. That's how I interpreted it. After she gets this drunk, do you think we can rule Yasmin out? No, I don't think so. Because she could have pretended that it was hitting her harder than it actually was. I can't think of a mole actually getting drunk drunk off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't think she was drunk drunk, but but I think she was definitely... If she was, if she's the mole, she'd be aware enough that she was tipsy and just play into the tipsy hand a bit more. And oddly enough, tip the... The, the tray. <laughs> so when they are crossing a precarious section, Yasmin regrets the wine and drops her one glass. And Lennart uh, returns with his first bucket of grapes, just as Katrine drops a glass herself. The Stompers fill their bucket just as the others reach them, earning them two glasses each. And they have 22 minutes to finish the journey by riding on a wine cart downhill. Lennart is not excited. And Kevin thinks it's raining, but it's actually Philip's glass landing on his back. <laughs> you know how you don't like roller coasters? Well, I, I like the thrill of it, but I'm terrified of them. Would you have been alright with this? I think so, yeah. I would be more focused on the trays than the actual ride itself. I mean, I'm 99% sure that they built this challenge purely because they saw the wine roller coaster and thought, that is a brilliant thing we can strap people into. Well, holding glasses of wine on a tray. Yeah, which, to be fair, is kind of the MO of a lot of Belgian mole challenges, which is just, here's this awesome thing we can strap people into. But, I mean, I saw this wine roller coaster for want of a better word, and just went, that is so cool. I never knew that they transported grapes downhill like that, but that is so cool. Yeah, I actually wrote that down too. I'm like, man, I can't believe that this is actually a thing that exists. A roller coaster transportation device. I think anyone who watched this episode went immediately afterwards... I really wonder if I can have a ride on that. That looks like so much fun, because it really looks fun. Yeah, you have to take note of where that is. And the other element of this is the fact that obviously when you have something like this, where it's a wine roller coaster, the puns do start flying, especially in the Bothers Bar Discord. There were some that I was quite proud of. There were some that I think are a little bit tenuous. So just off the top of my head, Seven Dwarfs Wine Train, Formula Rosé, the Corkscrew, which is one of Matt Clemson's ones. California Riesling, another Matt Clemson one. Crush's Coaster, The Barnstorm Merlot, and of course, my personal favourite, Dudley Do Right's Rips or Echo Falls. <laughs> so they have 11 glasses left at the end. Dammy's isn't full. Sven's both are. Samina's both are. Kevin's one is full. Noah's two are full. Katrine's one is full. And Lennart's two both aren't full, meaning they earn 1,600 euros of 4,000 for the challenge. And afterwards, they can enjoy the wine they carry finally. Katrine says she doesn't drink, but is told to down it anyway. What was funny during the hike, too, was when the hikers or the people that were going to the ceremony just had to walk by them as they're like just teasing them, saying they get to do a normal walk down to the monastery while we have to try and balance these trays in a very careful manner over a two hour period. I genuinely don't know how any of those glasses made it. It's a miracle they got 8 of 20 across the line. Yeah, I'm thinking, this just looks like one of those... Imp I thought they were going to get some extra help, because it just looked like an impossible challenge. So the fact, 8 glasses still across the finish line. Because if it was just me, by myself, without even thinking I was on the mole, I don't think even my glasses would have made it. 
No, because you got to think, we didn't see a single person put their tray down. And I'm assuming they did at some point, like when they were climbing down the ladder or whatever. But nobody was seen to have a rest at all. That must have absolutely knackered their hands and their wrists. Because even though it's only a small amount of weight, a small amount of weight for a prolonged period of time really, really hurts. It's the basis of most survivor immunity challenges now. Standing there with a small amount of weight on you, just having to wait until your body gives up. So in the evening, Katrine and Philip drive them. They have no idea where the GPS is taking them, nor that who's in what car will actually be important. And they drive to a garage door, which shuts on them. Car 1 is Philip, Sven, Dami, Noah and Kevin. And car 2 is Samina, Katrine, Yasmin, Lennart and Anna Lotta. The two garages form the entrance to a former Cold War bunker. Gilles comes over the tannoy and tells car 1 to go to room 228 and car 2 to 301. He tells them that there is good news and bad news. The good news is that this may be the easiest challenge in mole history. All they have to do is not push any buttons for 45 minutes, and they will earn 3,000 euros. The bad news is that tonight, two people, one person from each group, will be executed. If they push the red button in front of them, their chairs will blow up at the elimination, and two people from the other group will go. The buttons are currently locked with a code, which they can find on the cardboard box in the other room. I have to preface this with, if you've listened to any of our mole podcasts before, you will know Double Elimination is one of our least favourite twists ever. I also don't particularly like the fact that there are two consecutive twist eliminations, because we had the Vidum-style non-elimination last week. If you don't see your screen and it's red, then you're all safe. And now we have this one. However, they get massive amounts of points for me just from the style of this challenge. Because not only did they find this Cold War bunker, which, can I point out, is very difficult to find on Google. It has been tracked down now. I'm not going to try and pronounce it because it's very long German words and I can't remember it off the top of my head. It's very difficult to find this bunker anyway. They found this really cool location for it. It's blatantly obvious that this challenge would have been amended had someone gone home last week anyway. Because they would have just said, if nobody pushes a button, then all nine of you are vulnerable. If somebody pushes a button, then the car that didn't push it. It's the only people who are vulnerable at the execution. They still could have amended this. But I think it's better that there is a double elimination early rather than late. There is also Belgi law for this. I know I'm going to keep referring back to Belgi law, but in South Africa, we did have the price of hands. In episode two, that was a double elimination. It's not unprecedented. And it feels less medley than some of the Vidim ones. I'm not going to let them off the hook for doing a double elimination generally, but it feels less egregious here than in Bidham. And it happens once again. They did the same way in South Africa, where, sure, there's essentially non elimination in the first round of the game, and then you knock out two people in the second episode, and they do the same thing here. It's not in Vidim where you wait until you're down to final six. Like, they, like for some reason, they love to do that <laughs> over the last three seasons they've done it at final six. Or, or not three, I guess three of the last four seasons. I was going to say it wasn't a double in Czechia, was it? Oh, I guess, well, I guess Czechia, I guess Czechia was just because it was one out of three and it felt like a double elimination. But just doing those really low odds where there's a mass exemption and it happens right near the end of the game. Here, at least whenever Belgian Mole has done the double elimination twist, both times it's been the first elimination of the season. It's always way better to have a controversial twist at the very beginning as opposed to near the end. I also love how, just like in our South Africa recaps, you're completely forgetting that Jess existed as well. Yeah. Because South Africa's one was technically a double elimination uh, as a second one, but Jess doesn't count. Yeah, it's like mean that they did it near the start of the season. And there was a reasonable chance that somebody was going to go home in the first episode. I assume how it would have been modified for how this challenge would have been modified for this episode is that if you press the button, then one person from the other group has to get executed rather than two. It would have just been one person's going home right after this challenge because you're doing the test and execution, but you can save your entire car if you press that red button and the elimination will come from the other team. That's the exact same same challenge, basically. It's just because of nobody going home last week, we do have to get rid of two of you here just to make sure there's eight for next week. But yeah, so there's that, that improves upon whenever Vidim does it. Number two, they fit it in with the whole Cold War theme 
for the challenge rather than Vidim just doing it on a whim. And what was the third aspect to it? Oh, the fact that they put in so much emotion to everyone processing the whole double elimination. Once they realize, oh crap, two people from the other group have to go home, and everyone's pleading with each other, saying, let's not screw up the group dynamic. In Vidim, it's completely emotionless whenever they do these double eliminations. It's just, oh, two of us are going home, and then two people go home. It's like, oh, sucks that those two people went home, and then they just move on as if nothing happened. Here, there's a solid, what, five minutes before they even take the quiz of everyone just being like, we feel so horrible that two of us have to go home. Yeah, I think it goes back to what I've said in the past year, in that Belgium feels much more like the story of the contestants, and Vidum feels much more like the story of the mole. Belgi is kind of these people's amazing adventure, and also someone is sabotaging a little bit, whereas Vidum feels like, here is the mole, they are this kind of mythical beast, and someone has to slay them, but we're not going to focus on too many people just because we don't need to. So, the people who go to the other room, initially at least, is Kevin and Dami for car number one, and Katrine and Anna Lossert for car number two. After ten minutes have elapsed, they can call each other, Samina says that she won't lie to the other group, but Yasmin is tempted to. In the other room is a box full of strips that they can put through a telex machine. The strips will give them riddles to work out a code. And both teams use mental maths to try and work out the codes, while their teammates debate on whether they should push the button. Yasmin does say that it would go from a 10% chance of elimination to a 40% chance. No, it wouldn't. It would go from a 20% chance to a 40% chance, if someone pushes the button. How would you have played this as a contestant or a mole? Probably the same way for either position. I guess if you're the mole, you got to pretend to be a contestant for this because there's going to be enough chaos as is. Yeah, I think it's fair to say nobody was going to not push the button because independently they're thinking, well, I'm saving myself. It's the selfish choice. Whereas if they actually think five minutes after the reveal happens, oh shit, we've condemned two of the other five people to go, Maybe if they thought about that earlier, they might not have pushed the button. I think at least one team was going to push the button, because I think the Mole, regardless, pushes their team to push the button. Yeah. Because it's a, a €5,000 cost. Not that they potentially know that by the time the button gets pushed. They do, as it happens, but they don't necessarily know it. Yeah, I don't think the Mole has to do much to make sure money that money stays out of the pot this round. And I like how when the two teams get to communicate, Yasmin tells Philip... You know, if you push that button, I will kill you. And then she pushes the button anyway. And then she pushes the button anyway. (laughs) Just tries to intimidate the the oldest contestant in the game saying, I am going to kill you if you try to take money out of the pot. Psych, I'm going to screw you over anyway. (laughs) I like how casual Philip was. He's like, yeah, uh uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, you'll kill me. You'll kill me in my sleep. You'll kill kill me tonight. Okay, all right, bye. Bye -bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye. (laughs) <laughs> that just killed me in the conversation too. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna send anthrax to my house after the season is over. Okay, okay, okay. You're gonna kid- kidnap my family too. Okay, okay. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna burn down my house while I'm still inside while I'm sleeping. Okay. All right. Good talk, Yasmin. You're gonna skin me alive and uh, wear my skin as a suit to my mother's birthday party and rub my balls up and down her leg. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm gonna be a human coat. Nice chatting with you. See you tomorrow. (laughs) But that's how the conversation played out like. I think after two episodes, we've really got a good sense of all ten of these people, and it's something Belgium is super strong with, is I can tell you a lot about, I would say, eight of the ten people in this episode. Yeah, the only person who I can't tell you much about still is Enelot. She hasn't made a strong impression on me yet. I was still kind of hesitant on... uh, on Anna Lossa and Yasmin in terms of telling them apart. I got better at it this week, but I still had a few kind of wobbles. Yeah, same here. I think by the end of it, I'm like, okay, I'm pretty sure that's Yasmin and that's Anna Lott. Because <laughs> Yasmin usually wears glasses. Yeah, I don't know why I, I actually had an issue with both of them, given that they don't look that alike, but I think it's just their vibe. They're very similar personality-wise. So... So the phones ring and they are connected with each other. Yasmin says that their first thought would be to push, but they want to be honest with the other team. Philip says that his team are going for the 5,000 euros, but at that point it's only 3,000. Yasmin immediately gets off the phone and says he was lying. 
and she also spots that he said five thousand euros as opposed to three. And I, th- I don't know what to think about that because I spotted it as well before Yasmin pointed it out. If he is the mole, and there was that slip, I don't think they include that in the episode. I think it makes it too obvious if he's the mole. Yeah. Having said that, there is the issue of a double bluff, and the editors going, "Well, everyone's going to think it's too obvious. We'll keep it in just to kind of give him a little nudge." So Philip is in my suspect list this week because he does do a few kind of shadier things, but I don't know what to I don't know what to think about him accidentally saying five thousand euros if he is the mole. So Gio reveals to us that the correct code is hidden in a flap in the box, not in the strips for the telex that are inside the box. Dami is summoned back by her team for an explanation and tells them essentially to stop wasting her time because they've only got 45 minutes. And Philip is the first one we see that actually mentions that the code is written on the box rather than in the box. Jill then comes over the tannoy and tells them that if both teams push the green button on their console within the last minute, the prize money will jump to 5,000 euros. And Yasmin tells them on the phone call that she will kill them in their sleep if they push the button. Philip and Kevin swap in the code room, and Yasmin and Anna Lotta swap too. Noah asks Kevin if there was anything in the box. Jill warns them over the tannoy there is only 10 minutes left. Both groups rip open their boxes and begin to decode the actual number. They rush back to their buttons and hit the red one, and it's Carl 2 who were first, meaning that no money's earned for the challenge, and that two of Noah, Sven, Philip, Kevin, and Dami are going home. And Philip tells them that they greatly disappointed him. That means that they earned 5,800 euros of 17,000 for the episode, and 8,500 of 30,000 for the season so far. Interestingly, as we said at the start of the episode, three of the four people who could have got a red screen last week are in the vulnerable chairs. And the one element of this that we didn't actually mention is the fact that they genuinely exploded the elimination chairs of the other five people. And for some reason, Ruth got sprayed with paint too. I just love how how Belgian producers have such a flair for the ridiculous visuals. Because, yeah, you have something like the Ruth Elimination Challenge in the very first episode of the reboot in Argentina. No one else in the world is ever going to think of that sort of stuff. And then you have another one here, which is, here's a Cold War bunker in the middle of Germany. Can we do five explosions for this? Oh, and also, the five people who were vulnerable, they are still technically sitting on a bomb when they're doing the execution. (laughs) Somebody accidentally pushes the button. (laughs) <laughs> I'm assuming they were deactivated before people actually sat on those chairs, but there is still that kind of niggling suspicion in the back of your mind going, I really hope they cancelled those bombs. I hope nobody slips on the red button and explodes them, because that could be a very interesting situation. Team Rocket is blasting off again! <laughs> I also think it's really interesting that the B-roll we saw of the chair explosions from the start of this challenge was a bit spoilerific, actually. It It was the same explosion as actually happened in the episode, which means that they pretty much told us which car was going to win and which chairs were going to explode at the start of this challenge. If you paid attention to who drove into what garage, I think you could have worked out which team were going to win straight away. Yeah, but it's 50-50 shot that they're going to show the correct side that explodes. Yeah, but in the end, it could have actually been neither of them explode. Obviously, it wasn't going to be, but it could have been in theory. So it is now time for the test. 20 questions on the identity and actions of the mole. The two people who know least will be out of the game, except for the mole who can never go home. Katrine, Yasmin, Annalotta, Lennart, and Samina are all safe at this execution. Which means Lennart has gone two episodes with zero screen. I like how after they all do the quiz, when they're all gathered together, Jill says, Huh, the red button sure was popular, eh? I was thinking that is just uh, that is peak savage chills at the execution. I must admit, I I like this season a lot, but it does slightly lose something the fact that Gilles can't directly interact with them. I think I know it's unavoidable yeah, and everything. It's it's just Gilles is such a wonderful host, and I'm not blowing smoke knowing that he's probably going to listen to this. Gilles is such a wonderful host that he enjoys fucking with people face to face, and I know it's unavoidable. And I'm not going to hold it against him or anything, but. Imagine the first two episodes with Zeal actually being able to properly mess with them close up. You know what would have been great is if for each person that's executed, their chairs explode too. Paint bomb. 
<laughs> just oh no, there's slumps everywhere. Instead of showing screens, Jill just turns the key in front of him and presses a red button, and it just explodes the two people. Yeah. It's like Austin Powers with the chairs when Doctor Evil pushes the button and the chairs tip over, so the henchmen fall into the pool of of sharks. It does sound like a proper game show elimination, doesn't it? It's like an ejector seat. <laughs> all right, who's going to clean all of these limbs up? So Kevin says that it's do or die. In a normal situation, his chance of going home would be ten percent. Now it's forty percent, and if they have them all in their team, it's fifty percent. Dammy says that the wine challenge was really difficult, so it's easy to drop something. She rules out Sven and Katrine as they both transported one or two of their glasses. Sven says there was a debate with Anna Lotta, but she drops hers within 50 metres of the start line, despite having experience in being a waiter. Noah says that Kevin would be a good mole as everyone likes him, and Philip says he took an extreme gamble, he went all in on someone on the second test. If he's right though, he's in the finale. Is that how it works? Mm, not so much. Because, especially in the early rounds, all you have to do really is score one or two, I think, to survive. There is a very strong chance that both Demi and Kevin scored zero here. Maybe one. So only the five vulnerable people are at the execution. Demi gets an instant red screen. Phillips is green. And Kevin's is red. Impressive performance from both of us. So next time, they head to Munich. There are dogs, vinyls, basketball, dominoes and a challenge requiring everyone to keep their heads on a table. Given that both Demi and Kevin were immune during the first execution, there's a very, very good chance that they had the two lowest scores out of all ten people. Yeah, I really hope we get that answer at the reunion, to find out who would have gone home in the first round. Because it, it must have been one of Demi and Kevin. Or if one of the other five would have probably gone home here. But I have, a, I have a feeling that it was like Dammy and Kevin were the bottom two in both episodes. The thing is, the other five didn't even do the test this time. So we don't know who would have gone home from their group. It was literally just between these five people. And it's a real shame if it was Kevin who was meant to go home last week, because it would have saved me so much grief in terms of my pool choices and first suspicions. So who do you suspect? <laughs> who are your top three? <laughs> So Sven, he was terrible at karaoke, plus he set the wine pace too fast. Let me put that into my notes too. Let's see, Leonard's my number two. He suddenly jumped in there because his miming was pretty bad. He didn't exactly do the best with singing. Both of his glasses were below the line, and I felt like he was pleading with the group a bit too hard to stick together after they had pushed the red button, like pleading with all ten people saying, hey... Let's not ruin the vibe of this group. It would really suck. It's almost like he was taking a leadership position as the mole, knowing he'd be there through to the end and didn't want the rest of his experience to absolutely suck as the mole. So that's why I put him in the number two spot. Yasmin jumped in there because she got drunk at the wine challenge and didn't do too well at guessing the words, considering they only did get two out of the four correct. And the other person that was guessing with her is now gone. And then Analot I threw in there as an honorable mention, just because she's a bit mysterious to me. She dropped her wine glass instantly, and no one really talked about that. And she perfected piano playing, but she wasn't really shown as teaching Kevin properly, considering how poorly Kevin does during his performance. And I've ruled out Katrine because she had so many opportunities to sabotage when teaching piano, but Philip did too well at the piano, which is why I've, of course, ruled out Philip, and there's just... There's just too many things where they want to make us think Philip is the mole, such as say, no, if I go all in on one person, I'll be in the finale for sure. And just his behavior in the bunker, I'm thinking, hmm, they're trying a bit too hard with Philip. And then I've ruled out Noah too, just because he doesn't really act all that moly. And he seemed way too nervous initially when everyone found out that he could be the mole. So that's my rundown of everyone left in the game. The thing you have to bear in mind is that if Noah is the mole, then Jens was the mole. And Jens was not the mole. So that rules Noah out for me. Lena is my number one, purely because, as you said, he just did some sneaky stuff. And it's things like the wine being slightly below the line is an easy mole sabotage. But also, he was running up and down those vineyards trying to get grapes and completely unattended. He was the only person completely unattended in that challenge. And yes, he did bring back enough grapes, but only just. 
it was only due to Samina and Noah's good work at the end that they actually managed to fill up the jug. My number two, purely out of necessity, is probably Philip, because I don't want to get burned. If Philip does end up being a really obvious mole, then I don't want to be the guy who went, oh no, it definitely can't be Philip. And then for my number three, I was debating between Sven and Katrine all day, basically today. And I'm going to go with Sven, purely because he really sabotaged that Carpal Karaoke Challenge. And if they're trying to subvert our expectations in terms of the mole should definitely be on the piano side, then Sven was the most suspicious in the other side for me. And the fact that he that everyone kept complaining that he was walking too fast with the wine glasses. Yeah. On the Lennart point, if it is Lennart, he feels like a young mole. And I know we had Alina last uh, last year who was a young mole. And I've just looked this up. Can you remember how old Van Bool was when he was the mole? 26? Ooh, 27. Lennart feels so much younger at 25 than Van Bool did at 27. So he would feel like a very young mole, even though actually he's only, if he is the mole, two years younger than uh, the record male mole. So it's interesting. I'm plumping for Lena at the moment in terms of my number one suspects, purely because there's just something kind of, it's just a little bit suspicious at the moment for him. So pure gut feeling, especially two weeks into this. So final bits of housekeeping. The first suspicions list, we had a record number of first suspicions submitted, so thank you to everyone who submitted one. It's fair to say that I was very surprised at how many we had. It was about double how many it was for um, for Czechia, I think. So it was amazing to see that spreadsheet nice and full, to be honest. Uh, some interesting facts is that uh, the first person to submit was Femke, and Femke had all of Logan's team in the pool in spots one to five, and all of mine in six to ten, which is very interesting because it was before the pool was actually revealed. Only two people do not have any first suspicions, which is Annalotta and Jens, and Lennart is the only person not in anyone's bottom two. Kevin was number one before this week happened, but now Lennart takes that spot. It was Kevin, Lennart, Sven, Philip, Katrine, Yasmin, Samina, Dami, Annalotta, Noah, and then Jens. It is now Lennart with an average score of 2.91 out of eight. Sven at 4.24, Philip at 4.35, Yasmin at 4.41, Katrina at 4.47, Samina at 4.85, Annalotta at 5.03, and Noah at 5.74. Only Lennart, Katrina, and Noah are less suspected by me and you than the group as a whole. And also, little announcement that I only made a decision on yesterday, to be honest. Since you did try and make me crown as solo winner for Czechia, we do now actually have a tiebreaker. I'm keeping an eye on your existing lists. So whoever has the lowest score at the end will win if there is a tie. So it's how you place the other two people in the final three that will also determine it if there is a tie. So first would be one point, second would be two points, etc. The lowest score you can currently have is 36, and the current two leaders are on 41 points. Logan and I are both on 48, and the average is 46.47 on that. So our two teams are now drafted on the pool. I drafted Annalotta, Katrine, Kevin, Leonard, and Philip in alphabetical order. And Logan drafted Dami, Yasmin, Noah, Samina, and Sven. Interestingly, I have all of my top four and eighth place. And Logan has one, two, three, six, and ten. If the drafting orders were reversed, so if you'd kept Alina last season, only two people would have actually swapped teams, which was Noah and Katrine. Otherwise, we would have had the same teams that we do have now. Obviously, with the result of this episode, Logan and I both lose our top suspicions from last week, and one team member each. Mine is now Anna, Lassie, Katrine, Leonard, and Philip, and Logan's is Yasmin, Noah, Samina, and Sven. Have you got anything else you want to say? Do you want to eulogise Kevin and Dami, or do you think we've already done it? Uh, I think we have. We thought they were the mole, and they're not! <laughs> Both were great characters. I think Jill referred to them as the... Uh, he's like, oh man, I can't believe we're losing a golden duo. And I can't help but agree with that. Both were great characters in their two episodes. And it's a shame that we have to lose them both so early into the game. I must admit, I was absolutely howling when I saw who'd got the uh, the red screens when I was watching the execution. Because I'm like, you genuinely could not write this. That your first suspicion from last week, my first suspicion from last week, both got executed straight away. 
and we're completely and utterly lost on who it is. And I love it. I love mole seasons where I'm genuinely stumped until the very last second. I really do not have a problem with us being so utterly clueless. But I just find it really very funny that we were so kind of gung-ho, especially on Kevin last week. I was so gung-ho that it was Kevin last week. And it's just like, yeah, Kevin went. Oopsies. I think I even said that even if Demi's not the mole, that she was going to go far into the game. And then it's like, no, not only is she not the mole, but she's first out. (laughs) The very rare instant red screen, which very, very rarely happens in the mole. (laughs) I love us being genuinely bamboozled by this show. It's so much fun. Because it makes it really interesting to watch, for me at least. So, thank you for listening to our Demol Bells Eureka. We will be back next week to continue the hunt for a brand new mole in Germany. Don't forget you can contact us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube or Instagram where we are RTV Warriors. Or you can email us on contact at rtvwarriors.com. Logan is on Twitter at Lucas Pukwaki and I'm MJ Harmstone. Thank you as always to Natalia for the subtitles and we will see you next week. Peace out and just chill till the next to flavoury. Don't panic. 